Good morning and thank you for having me here. My name is Francesca Biondo, I'm a postdoc at King's College London and UCL and today I'll be presenting some recent findings from a study where we've looked at brain age which is a neuroimaging based biomarker as a predictor of a future diagnosis of dementia and we did this within a real world setting of memory clinic patients. So what is brain age? We know that as we age, the risk of disease is increasing as well as the risk of mortality. We also know that performance is changing with ageing. For example, as early as the age of 20, uh, many aspects of cognition start to decline, including working memory and speed of processing. But we know that it isn't just performance which is affected by ageing. It is also the underlying biology which is uh, changing. And in fact, the research in the biology of aging is a vast field and various factors have been identified as being a key in this aging process, uh, including genetic and epigenetic factors and metabolic and cellular changes. And these factors are themselves linked to more visible features of aging, such as changes in the bone and muscle mass and the way that fat is deposited uh, around the body as well as morphological changes in biological systems so for example the cognitive decline that i described in the previous slide is associated to changes in the structure of the brain such as atrophy of subcortical areas and the enlargement of the ventricles and so on and these factors and these features could be causes of the aging process but also potentially consequences or, or potentially a mix of these two. However, we know that the aging process does not affect people uniformly. There is variation across individuals and also variation within the same individual across the lifespan. What if I told you that the pianist in the photograph is 30 years old? Well, you would probably be surprised given the visible signs of aging in the skin. And what if I said, actually, the pianist is a hundred years old and is still playing the piano? Then perhaps we might think of the pianist as a so-called superager, which is a term described um, for older adults with abilities that are relatively preserved compared to their peers. So, in a similar way, can the brain be biologically older or younger than the real age and can we measure this brain age? Brain age is an estimate or index of age based on neuroimaging features and the neuroimaging features in the study are the brain volumes at the voxel level of a T1 weighted MRI scan. Now from brain age we can derive the key measure which is brain pad, the brain predicted age difference or brain gap and other variants for the same concept and brain pad is equals to the brain age minus the real age. Now we know how to obtain the real age, how do we calculate brain age? We do this via a machine learning approach in the study, I've used the, the brain age algorithm, which, uh, which developed by James Cole, which you can freely download from GitHub. And following a typical approach in machine learning, there's an initial training phase in which we take many structural T1 scans from a healthy group of participants, which we know the chronological age. And then we extract the brain volume features at the voxel level and use this and in conjunction with the age, we model these via a Gaussian processes regression model. And then in the second phase, we validate the model uh, in a separate uh, sample of, of MRI scans, and then see how well the, the model is doing through performance measures. And here we have a mean absolute error of 3.9 years. This model has also been um, externally validated and uh, showed a mean absolute error of 4.9 years. Once we're sufficiently happy that the model is estimating age uh, um, accurately enough, 
we can then go ahead and use the model to predict age, uh, brain age in uh, our uh, sample of interest. And hence, we now get a brain age measure for each participant. So we subtract the real age from the brain age, we now get the key measure, measure which is brain pad. So for example, if somebody's brain age is 80 years, and their real age is 70 years, then their brain pad is plus 10 years, which means that their brain is looking on average 10 years older than it should be when compared to the healthy participants on which the model was trained. So a positive brain pad is, is indicated here and it's showing that it's an older looking brain and the younger looking brain shows a negative deviance from the model here. And so what do we know about uh, larger uh, positive brain pads or older looking brains and younger looking brains? Well, it's no surprise that having an older looking brain is not great news. In fact, it is associated to a series of poor health outcomes, including poorer lung function and cognition, as well as risk, increased risk of mortality. And on a more positive note, having a younger looking brain is associated to people who exercise more, people who meditate and people who are learning to play a new musical instrument. What does a larger brain pad reflect? One hypothesis is that it may be reflecting a deviation from healthy aging. So here we can see the risk of cognitive decline, which increases as we get older. And this is the healthy aging trajectory. And perhaps a larger brain pad being indicative of a deviance from this healthy trajectory, where there's an acceleration of aging processes, perhaps uh, due to all sorts of possible uh, factors, including a genetic and environmental insult. Now, in the recent years, the research of using brain age as a predictor, especially in clinical settings, has flourished. And of particular note, some recent studies that looked at how this could be predictive of a series of psychiatric and neurological conditions, in particular dementia and MCI. And in, in a similar vein to these recent uh, studies, we asked whether a brain age could be predictive of a future diagnosis of dementia within a real world setting of memory clinic patient. But first, let me explain the problem scenario that motivated this research question. People with memory complaints may get referred to a memory clinic, and here the clinician is faced with the task of understanding the cause for that memory complaint. Now, typically, the clinician will make a diagnosis of dementia primarily based on cognitive and behavioural evidence. However, the clinician will often run other tests like a blood test and an MRI scan to also exclude other possible causes for that memory complaint, for example, a brain tumour or a urinary tract infection. Also, it's not uncommon for an MRI scan report to be incongruent with the patient's symptoms. For example, a patient could be doing very poorly cognitively speaking, but then the scan report would uh, be labelled as age appropriate. So the question is, can we uh, capitalise on these existing NHS protocols and extract something which is additionally helpful for the clinician? clinicians in investigative work. So can we detect patterns of abnormality which are otherwise um, invisible to the radiologist's eye and that could be additional, could have additional value to the radiologist's report and hence help with the diagnosis and prognosis of the memory clinic patient. And one possibility is that brain age could be uh, useful in this diagnostic uh, process. And here is, uh, this is the gave uh, rise to the barcode study, which is the brain aging and risk of cognitive decline study, which James Cole set up uh, just over a year ago, just before I joined the lab. Uh, we started off the study by pre-registering it. And we also had a run a focus group where we discussed with members of the public, including patients with dementia, what they thought uh, about uh, brain age. To answer our research question, we access data from uh, memory clinics, the BRC-MEM and BRC-DEM studies, 
which have been recently linked to electronic health records of these patients via the clinical record interactive search at the Maudsley Biomedical Research Centre and the Department of Neuroimaging at King's College London. And this linkage has allowed us to determine which of these patients with this neuroimaging assessment went on to have a diagnosis of dementia or other diagnoses. We started with a total sample of 3,651 uh, memory clinic patients and after a series of pre-processing uh, filters including uh, a QC of the MRI scans we ended up with a total sample of 1,140 patients and out of these 476 patients uh, went on to get a dementia diagnosis after the neuroimaging assessment and they're shown here in orange and 664 patients uh, went on to get a diagnosis which wasn't dementia, shown here in grey. And compared to the no dementia group, the dementia group had less males, they were older, they were doing more poorly on the mini mental state examination test, they were diagnosed more quickly, the brain volumes were smaller, and their brain pads were looking uh, larger, so the, they had older looking brains. To test the predictive value of brain pads in classifying patients in the no dementia dementia group, I used the log logistic regression and drop curves, along with age, quadratic age, sex, MMSC, and normalized brain volume as covariates. And we can see that brain pad is a significant predictor with an odds ratio of 1.4. The rock curves are uh, doing reasonably okay for the full model, but uh, it's just above chance uh, when, it, when, when looking at brain pad adjusted for the covariates or brain pad as a single pr predictor. But we were interested to look at uh, brain pad in the context of also looking at the time between the neuroimaging assessment and the diagnosis. And so to factor in the time element, we used uh, a survival analysis using Cox proportional hazards regression analysis. And this again showed that brain pad is a significant predictor with a hazards ratio of 1.03 which is um, which basically means that for every one year of brain pads, there's a 3% relative increased risk of dementia diagnosis, um, assuming that the other variables are constant and there is a, and a, assuming a similar demographic. And uh, we can see these results um, better illustrated through a Kaplan uh, Mayer plot, which shows, the probability of not having a dementia diagnosis. So at the start, none of the patients had a dementia diagnosis and the ones with larger brain pad uh, scores progressed to dementia diagnosis more rapidly. I also wanted to look at the importance of the predictors. And so I reran the analysis using standardized versions of the predictors so that we could have a look at the standardized coefficients and we can see that um, all, all the predictors were significant and important in this model, but of particular note is how important age is in, in predicting dementia. So to put things into perspective, having a brain pad score, which is uh, positive, but uh, whilst uh, still young in age, is still better off than having a reasonable brain pad score, but being much older. And this is not surprising. And obviously this reminds us that we need to look at brain pad and the context of these other predictors. But it also motivated uh, the, uh, you know, uh, it motivated a series of, of sensitivity analysis to try and unpack a little bit more the value of brain pad, the potential value of brain pad in, in the memory clinic. 
And so first we ran a sensitivity analysis that looked at the time between the, the neuroimaging uh, uh, assessment and the diagnosis. So initially in the main analysis, we had a threshold of three months. So anyone who got a diagnosis, whether that was dementia or non-dementia, within three months of the neuroimaging assessment was not included. So we thought, what if we increase that threshold to three years? And so uh, keep uh, and, and see how BrainPad is doing when we have uh, a more strict threshold and, 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 and in the sense that uh, how far into the, how far in, in time it, it does BrainPad remain predictive. And this gave us a subset of 249 patients and we can see that BrainPad is actually doing better in classifying uh, patients, uh, dementia patients from non-dementia patients. Um, and the survival analysis again showed that BrainPad was a significant predictor with actually a, um, a larger uh, risk of uh, dementia diagnosis. So that for every five years of BrainPad, there was a 31% increased risk of dementia diagnosis. And this analysis suggests that BrainPad is predictive even when the neuroimaging assessment uh, precedes uh, the diagnosis by at least three years in, in time. In the second sensitivity analysis, we looked at, uh, we wanted to look at cognition. So we used MMSC, which is a 30 item test and for which there are existing guidelines as to what uh, these uh, uh, ranges of scores may be representing with lower scores, scores of 10 or less, uh, suggesting very poor cognition and reflecting perhaps severe forms of dementia. And so we thought uh, if the highest band on the scale is 21 to 26, what if we subsample to a score of 27 upward? And so we retain the ones that are doing reasonably well in the MMSC, suggesting that their cognition is relatively spared, or at least as measured in this test. And so we ask how does BrainPad do uh, when you have patients who are difficult to uh, distinguish in terms of the cognitive abilities? And we had this, uh, the sample resulted in 471 patients. And we can see that in terms of classification, uh, brain pad uh, in the adjusted format is, is not doing that great, but we can see that it's uh, in the survival analysis, it is uh, a significant predictor and is showing a 3% increased risk in terms of uh, a future diagnosis of dementia. Um, so when uh, cognitive assessments such as MSC are not able to differentiate between uh, or, uh, dementia diagnosis or no dementia diagnosis, brain pad can uh, have uh, uh, can be useful. To conclude, uh, we asked whether brain age could predict a future diagnosis of dementia in memory clinic patients, and the answer is yes in conjunction with other basic predictors, it can be a useful tool to the memory clinic pa uh, clinician in uh, diagnosis the memory clinic patient, uh, but not by itself, but along with other basic predictors. In summary, we saw how a brain pad is predictive of dementia diagnosis with a 15% increased risk for every five brain pad years. We saw that it's, it remains predictive as early as three years before the diagnosis, and it is also predictive when cognitive functioning is normal as measured by the MMSC. And for future work, we plan to run other analyses where we look at, uh, uh, we use other cognitive measures and clinical outcomes uh, in relation to this dementia, no dementia classification, but also incorporate um, other health comorbidities. Thank you very much for your attention. I would like to thank my collaborators, in particular James Cole, who I've been working very closely with, and also um, the staff at the BOC, in particular Amelia and Megan, who have been extremely supportive in the extraction of the patient data. Um, the clinical team, Christoph Muller and Claire Steves, um, as well as all the BRC DEM and BRC MEM patients, and uh, my colleagues at the Department of Neuroimaging, and as well as the Compage 2020 meeting organizers. Thank you very much.